And of course, the lovely audience here will have a chance to ask questions at the end of the session. So hold on to those questions and we'll give you plenty of time at the end of the session to ask questions. So the name of this session is No More Boats and Humble and it's really an opportunity to learn about some of the works of two of our visiting writers here in Alice Springs. Felicity Castagna, who works and writes about and in Western Sydney, and Abe Nook, who's from Melbourne but is originally from the Sudan, and is a spoken word artist and poet who often writes about his refugee experience. So we'll start with Felicity's new book we'll tell you about. It's called uh, No More Boats, just out from Giramondo. But she's also published the award-winning YA novel, The Incredible Here and Now. She's also a teacher and a PhD holder from the University of Western Sydney. And Abe Nook has also published a book of his poems entitled Humble, but he's better known for his performance work and his work with young people as the founder and director at Creative Rebellion Youth. So to Felicity's book, which she has here, No More Bones. So no guessing what, what that one's about, really. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to do something. I can't just say it. <laughs> Thanks, I'm going to hire you as my publicity assistant. Um, and I'm going to start by asking Felicity re to read the preface of the book to all give you a bit of a taste, because I know it's brand new out, you might not have read it yet, give you a taste of, of the work. It is 1967, the Australian Prime Minister, Mr Harold Holt, swims out into the ocean and gets eaten by a shark or he gets picked up by a Chinese submarine and becomes a spy. It's possible that he just shouldn't be swimming despite his reputation as a sportsman because he's thrown his shoulder out of alignment and is taking morphine and also because he might be depressed and maybe he doesn't want to live anymore. Others say he is murdered because he opposes building military bases at Pine Gap or because he relaxed the white Australia policy so that the Asians could invade. It could also be because the oceans around Australia are rough places where boats are known to fall apart and people get caught in rips they can't see and the people in the boats just disappear and no one knows why. Or sometimes they do know, but no one wants to talk about what really happens out there. Not really anyway. It is the day after Harold Holt has disappeared and Antonio Martone is standing in his new home. He is not yet the Antonio Martone who becomes so famous for a brief moment in history when his own existential crisis coincides with that of a nation that can't decide whether to let in a Norwegian container ship named the MV Tampa and its cargo of 438 human beings who'd almost disappeared into the ocean like Harold Holt. For that brief moment between the unwanted ship sitting out there off the coast and the planes colliding into twin towers in another country, Antonio is everywhere holding that gun that may or may not have been his. He's staring blankly out of everyone's television sets and out of the copies of the Daily Telegraph you always find discarded next to you on the train seat. For now though, he is just Antonio and he's here thinking about how the future has finally picked its way out of his head and materialised in front of him. He lays his body down in the middle of the living room and thinks about what he has built. He always knew the future was waiting for him in this new land across the sea. White aluminium siding, aluminium 8 over 8s, yellow fiberboard shutter has high rectangular windows, crisp brown linoleum marking the path to the kitchen. He'd done the front porch in an arch. People don't always understand how much harder it is to bend wood and concrete into a half moon shape than it is to leave it in straight angular lines, but he knows and it will be a deep and private satisfaction to him every time he walks through his own front door. His house is on a one acre block, big enough for a market garden out the back. He will grow olives and bergamots like his father did. Antonio, Rose says, looking at him lying there on the floor, I think you love this house more than me. She walks towards him, bringing her soft soapy smell, the soft clicking of herself. She rubs her belly, hoping she will be pregnant soon. Not much room to build a flower bed, Rose says, looking at the concrete lawn. Later, I make different. 
he says, but he knows he won't. It is cleaner this way. It makes the land look more solid. His wife wants so many impractical things. He locks the door and puts the key on its blue piece of yarn around his neck. They turn and face the horizon where the land is being cut up and divided and cut up and divided again into finite squares. Antonio has built his house on the hilly east side, the only place in Parramatta that isn't flat. Antonio looks towards the river, but he can't see it behind the mangroves. He is thinking of the point where the salt water meets fresh. He will take his line and hook up there later to see if he can catch a fish with the other men who sit by the pier. All he wants is this, his own patch of land, this moment in the afternoon, the future to keep coming and coming. Um, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that reading. Yes, so that sets the scene of the book. Mm -hmm. And I can't help, when I read the book, it's, it's about two things Australians get very excited about, real estate and immigration. Yeah. <laughs> it's about the heart of what we are as Australians. Yeah. Yes. What in, so what inspired you? What, what brought you this story of Antonio? Um, it's actually set in 2001, that's, that's the preface of when, when the main character comes to Australia from Italy. Um, uh, but it's set in the backdrop of the, of the Tampa crisis of it, um, 10 days on which you know, our television screens um, screamed that we were being flooded, inundated, invaded um, by tsunamis of migrants. Um, I Originally I, I told my publisher I wanted to write a history about, uh, like a, a book about the history of migration in Australia. And he was like, why don't you pick like a smaller subject than the whole history of migration in Australia? Um, um, but, but to me, even though it's set over 10 days, um, focusing on the boat has allowed me to um, talk about the whole history of migration in Australia. Um, I started thinking about, I wrote other books while I was writing this book, I kept returning to it. I started thinking about it, you know, almost 20 years ago. I. Um, I moved back to Australia. My, my family moved around a lot when I was growing up. And um, I came back here at kind of the, ha the height of Pauline Hanson. Um, and I remember looking at this, this woman on TV and looking at all of these news stories about these boats and thinking, this is a crazy country I have come to. Everybody thinks that they're um, you know, being invaded all the time. And, that kind of coincided as well with, I, I think, me being reunited with both sides of my family. My, my, my father's family were um, Greeks from Egypt who migrated to Ethiopia and intermarried with the Italian population there and came to Australia. Um, experienced a lot of bigotry and hardship um, in the 1950s when they landed here. Um, my mum's kind of family is white back to like colonial Australia. My dad was like the only migrant um, that her family had ever met when they got married. Um, and you know I was hearing all these kind of contradictory things about migrants from then from both sides of my family. It was like on one side I have this incredibly migrant family who experienced um, a lot of hardship in their journey here and, and in, in living here. Um, and could both sympathise with the with the migrants that they saw on TV coming by these boats. They came f by boats themselves um, after walking across multiple countries. Um, and at the same time, you know, kept kind of saying these things like, you know, but but we tried harder to fit in, and you know, we were new Australians, and you know, we we stopped speaking our language, and you know, like my father says all the time, I don't believe in multiculturalism, and I'm like, you are multiculturalism, <laughs> like you come from, you know, English is like your fifth language. Um, and, you know, also from my mum's family, the same kind of contradictory ideas. So I wanted to, you know, explore it in a novel. Mm. And Abe, we'll, we'll, we'll throw to you now, Abe. You, how? How, well, uh, how am I going to segue well, them why together? Why can't we just stay with Felicity? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Are these all of our online viewing streamers? Or are they somewhere else? Cause They're I, somewhere else. Oh. They're all around the territory. Right. So it's not you guys? No, no. These are our live, <laughs> in-person <laughs> audience. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your presence. And you've also got... You've, You've also adapted a play for, was it this book or a different one? No, my last book. All yeah. oh, right. And that's, is that coming out? When is that? Um, it's coming out in July t um, <laughs> 2017. You are my publicity assistant. <laughs> 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 Please.
please let's talk about you and your achievements. Let's <laughs> <laughs> just cut off the middleman. <laughs> um, <laughs> taking over my job. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, what's your reaction? You must hear this a lot of, of people, you know, many people here would have the second generation migrant experience, children of migrants, but you, you came here, your you're first generation came here in 2010, I believe? 20 2014? 2004. Two, oh, 2004, sorry. Ago, yeah. I don't even know what year it is, let alone yeah, what day it is at the moment. Um, <laughs> but we so can stay with 2010, I'm cool with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 2010. Yeah, cool um, what's your experience been as, as a refugee to Australia? Has it been welcoming? Has it been confronting? I know you explore a lot of this in your poetry, mm. so. Well, they've got a they've got an AFL diversity week in Melbourne where they uh, take all the new fam the new family arrivals into the stadium. And our neighbour rented a, a van. That's, that's how many members in my family. <laughs> uh, and then we got we, we got driven over into the MCG, and it was it was I think attendance had seventy thousand people, um, and I think. Mom and every one of us, we were shocked to have that many people in one space. And of course, during the first siren, the way people were going at it, <laughs> thinking this is not going to end well. Uh, <laughs> and about a fourth siren, uh, and it was, I'm not, I know I'm going to lose a lot of people by the time I finish this story. <laughs> it, was, it was Collingwood and Carlton and, Car and Collingwood won. Uh, see, I told you. Uh, they're going to start getting up and leaving. Please stay. And to all the online streamers, please, let me finish this story. Uh, it, <laughs> it was Collingwood and Carlton, and by the time that finished and everybody else leaving peacefully, I think that's when we knew we were in a strange country. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, we just we did not expect that it would be that peaceful, um, especially as, as as an event that brings people together and at the same time have such heated moments, and yet people recognizing that after the fourth silence, everybody was just packing up and leaving. We were just sitting there as a family in a row, just still in shock. And I think that was quite welcoming to be amongst <laughs> <coughs> that many people. And four of my older brothers have become devoted. Collingwood supporters. <laughs> Notice how I left myself out of that part. <laughs> I still got all of my teeth intact. So, <laughs> good for those of you who got that. I don't know how you got it, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it definitely welcoming. But with with the recent reclaim Australia um, nonsense that was going on, and my mom is a big fan of watching TV, and she's a big fan of Walid Ali, uh, which I'm jealous. <laughs> I'll be doing the same thing that he does, but that's beyond the point. And my, my, my little brother was was saying how um, how racist Australia has gotten, and and she literally stopped him in his tracks and said, "If you really going to generalize with that statement, you have to recognize that you live here. And if this country was really racist, you wouldn't be here, uh, just because of the, the small acts." Um, the, the other force fed, the other people that are force fed by fear, you can't really generalize and, 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 and think that that's how the whole country thinks. I, I think for my family it's been a welcoming experience. Yeah. And I, I, I was um, stalking you on YouTube to find out about yourself because you have a book, but it's very hands. hard to get your hands on your book, Humble. How many hand. were published? I was still handsome in those videos, yeah, I think. You were very, <laughs> still is. <laughs> no. Uh, we we self-published it. It was it was I think we did we did a crowdfunding, a little crowdfunding, and I think it was shocking in that when we started creating rebellion, we started working with the younger the kids that have come out of um, detention and have come out of juvie, and uh, the way we set up the space was to have uh, an InDesign computer, and so some of the kids started scribbling all of the poems that I have and, and put it together, and by the time we celebrated our first anniversary as a as, as a studio. They, that was already printed, so it wasn't really necessarily a thing that I had in mind. Uh, but I, 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 I never really wanted to print it, wanted the poems to be printed. But they did it as, as, as a surprise, and it was it was pleasant. And that's one of the reasons why it's unavailable because uh, it was so limited in, in in print. Can you publish another one soon? Can I hope so. I, mean, I hope I'll be able to write it. 
<laughs> start with them first. I'm still, still fresh to the language, really. I'm still, still learning all of it. I mean, my bucket list, number one on it is to buy more buckets. Number two is learn, <laughs> learn, learn a foreign language like Australian or British. Number f <laughs> I, think, I think it's somewhere in there. To, to, to <laughs> Write another, another book. But that is my, yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I don't, I don't suppose I've, uh, I'm able to yet comprehend uh, the whole experience of living in this country. And I think that's one of the, one of the, one of the main things that's, that's shocking us at the moment. It's almost like we get to live with the guilt of witnessing what could have potentially have been out my family's destination in terms of uh, having arrived here. So really, I'm, I'm still bewildered by the notion of living in a country where uh, I think the idea of freedom is literally self-defined. That 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 is still something that is uh, I'm I'm still astonished by it. And I think that's interesting in Felicity's book. The the character Antonio, who's arrived in the 50s, he's come from quite trauma of his whole village being sort of destroyed by natural disaster, and he probably came with these yeah these fresh ideas the trauma and yet he's ended up you know in Pauline Hansen's camp well. <laughs> um I think that you know that's not an uncommon story um and that's kind of why I wanted to not because I wanted to paint all Italians as racist um at all um you know we're good people um but because I wanted to look at um the complexities of racism in Australia. So, you know, if you look at it statistically, um, two thirds of us are, are either a migrant, we're married to a migrant, or one of our parents is a migrant. So, when we're talking about um, racism or discrimination against migrant communities, this um, the debate really isn't just about um, us and them. It's also about us and us. Um, we're all so incredibly close to the act of migration. Even if you are one of the small minority that doesn't believe long in that statistic, your family hasn't come here um, very long ago because um, we're, you know, we're such a newly colonised country. Um, so I wanted to, uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd never read a book like that. I actually did most of my PhD was in invasion literature. So um, I read like over 200 novels about um, about fear of um, invasion by boat to Australia. Um, it's a phenomenon that, that's been around since we we first colonised. Um, so, um, but but n none of those really explored. I thought something that was much more c more complex characters and more complex identities, um, and those kind of complex I identities I saw uh, see in my own community of um, like post World War Two um, European um, migrants. Uh, and I'm, mm. gonna, I'm revealing myself as obsessed by real estate now, but, but how did the real estate aspect get in? He's very much, because he's a builder, it's very much about the, um, I've built my own house, you can't have it. Everybody's yeah. trying to get their own little bit of, is it just a Sydney thing, because you're based in Sydney? That um, yeah, yes, it's a Sydney thing, but at the same time, um, I, I also was trying to, speak to the struggle and the trauma of so many generations of migrants who come here and and um, have to carve out their own patch and finally maybe get a bit of an anxious handle on something that belongs to them, like a house that they might have built and then feel threatened by subsequent generations of, um, of migrants who they feel threaten that space. Um, and I kind of also wanted to, I guess, talk to the absurdity um, of that. Um, which is kind of just as absurd as the Sydney real estate market. <laughs> when I, read, I mean, when you read the title, No More Boats, you think, oh, I, uh, are you supporting Pauline Hanson? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm, kidding, I'm kidding. Where did the title come from? Uh, okay, again, we switched jobs. Um, I was just going to be me and you attacking okay, her. Let's That's just talk. Um, okay, so the, the title actually comes from the fact that the um, it, Antonio, the main Italian migrant who's at the centre of the story, gets visited one night by the ghost of um, one of his migrant friends who... Um, comes to tell him to paint no more boats on his lawn. Um, so he paints a massive sign that says no more boats. Um, and the community gathers around this sign and I used it as a kind of um, 
way of discussing all the different perspectives that would come in a multicultural community like Parramatta when somebody puts a sign like that. Um, and the fact um, that people can be easily, um, get easily excited and persuaded by um, rhetoric that they don't necessarily understand. So Antonio gets co-opted by um, pe people who are basically um, Reclaim Australia. I actually um, did a lot of research on, on Reclaim Australia and Australia First. Um, interestingly enough, most of the heads of those organisations actually are from migrant backgrounds, like, um, the he you know, the head of Australia First. Um, and you can tell your mum this when she's watching TV. It's from, you know, got a um, Syrian background. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so um, another um, one is from Sri Lanka. So um, again, these kind of, these, these issues um, are really complex. I'd, I mean, I'd, I'd love to to hear you talk, what are some of the attitudes of um, the African migrant community to other migrant communities in Australia? We're still scared. Do you, have you guys seen um, the series Living with the Enemy? Yeah. Where's oh. that? So, yes. uh, you've, right, the man on there is one of the, Nick, Nick, I'm not sure, kind of call his last name. Uh, we did the part on migration and I didn't tell my mom about it. Um, and he came and stayed in my mother's house. Uh, and, and mom was being, I mean, she was cooking, she was having a blast. Um, and he's, he was one of the people who was opposing migration and, and things that uh, the, 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 the refugee crisis and the idea of multiculturalism does not suit Australia at all. So and with, with a professor from um, the Blue Mountains. Okay. So, it was amazing getting him to live with us and then at the same time mom seeing him on Reclaim Australia and her still insisting that that man here at my house, he's not racist. And we're like, no, but he's... It's been, it, it's been trickier for the, for the African community, in that especially, especially for the, during the election time. Everybody gets so paranoid. Yeah. You know, they just don't know what to do with themselves. Uh, and and right now with the with the way with the way everything is going, you see less and less of of, of the African community having to say. If, yeah. And it's just it's out of the out of the sense of not wanting to lose or not wanting to have an input or, or any 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 thoughts making it making their opinions public f from 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 just the fear of I think deportation. Yeah. yeah. And you work a lot with with young people, Abe. How how is this effect? What's the effect they have on this environment of no one wanting to speak out? And it's my oh goodness, it's the idea that um, half of them half of them have come here with with single parents, um, or widowed mothers. So really, it's it's still trying to trying to strike the right balance between contributing. Uh, it, with the community and at the same time trying to make sense of of this idea of having a bank card even though it says triple zero on there still it's it's a huge thing that they come into terms with. I mean we're too distracted with living and try, trying to trying to understand it that they're not even concerned with anything else just just tr trying to be sure that they're not um, in any way being an obstruction to, to the community and hence there's they're less visible other, other, than, than I've been, really. How did, how did you get so visible? Um, Through your spoken word? That too, that too, but I'm, I'm still shy. <laughs> sure if you notice, I'm, st I'm still very shy. But I, I guess it, it boils down to I think finding out a way to, to contribute. My older brother graduated as, as a doctor, and I know what a show off. And <laughs> my mom's still trying to figure out what it is that I do. Um, <laughs> trying to explain to her the idea of, or the art of spoken word. And she still goes, I'm, I'm not going to go out and hear you. you. You come to my house and speak to me. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. I, I, it, it all happened coincidentally. I, I, but I, I'm always fascinated by, by the idea of writing and, 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 and to be present. In, in the presence of other authors who've written, and that's the only reason why I'm here. I'm pretty much a stalker. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, that, that's what this festival's about. It's, it's not just about words on paper. It is about 
spoken word as well. And I, I don't know of anyone who hasn't he heard you speak. I don't, is there a poem you can, or a piece you can hit us with? Sure, sure. <laughs> All we ever wanted was to go to schools, to wear uniforms and run around with backpacks on our backs and have books and pencils and marvel at the magic of rubber, how it erases what we wrote wrong and fixes parts of the extra lines we drew. Pencils were expensive and half we would snap them to share it with those who could not afford to buy a pencil. Friends would read pages from exercise books to share with the ones who had none. Above all, we lastly longed for one thing, to read and reap from the magic of reading, which was bestowed upon those whose parents afforded school fees and most of the time, mom couldn't. Instead, we watched the kids who had backpacks on their backs and had books and pencils and got to marvel at the magic of rubber. Luckily, I learned the magic of reading from the rap songs I heard, lip syncing rap lyrics before I knew what they meant. I was walking around my mama's house talking about I was gonna clean my room, but then I got high. <laughs> <laughs> Not knowing what that meant, but it sounded good. <laughs> See, hip hop changed my mindset. It altered my life because now I can hold a pen and a pencil to pin a story. That's all I've ever wanted. And now that I have it, I'm trying to make the most of it by encouraging as many people as possible to do it. Becoming a father figure of some sort to my seven-year-old niece, one of our most obstruction in the house came at knowing when to dis disturb every single person living there. Grandma would talk about how she needs to pack all of her toys and put it in a bag. But when I'm babysitting, that's never the case. Realized one thing though, Watching her play with all of her Legos, it came to my attention that I can still do the same thing. I've never played with Lego, but I've learned to construct stories using the 26 letters from the alphabets, and without adult supervision, I think I figured it out. Hopelessness comes from the inability to express yourself. So can you imagine how hopeless I felt when I did not know how to read or write? When my world was limited and my imagination existed in small proportion and when no one took the time to encourage or remind me that I am more than my perceptions and that no dream was ever too small and I should value my thoughts often because thoughts are an investment of future outcomes. I envied every person I've met who showed me a diary they kept growing up. I despised them secretly because I wanted their memorable childhood and how bright their future looks as they become the grown-ups they've always wanted to be. While I'm left drowning in a sea of options, trying to make something of myself, but I did not know how to construct, so I longed to read and wish nights after the other, reminding myself not to wait on a shooting star, but to wish on the brightest one I see, just to be able to write. I was once the piece that never fitted the puzzle, looked at and quickly overlooked. Instead, I chose to blame no one, because if something were to change, it had to be me. I've never played with Lego, but I've learned to construct stories using the 26 letters from the alphabets. And without adult supervision, I think I figured it out. When you grow up and get told, put away childish things, don't put away your stories. There are 26 letters in the alphabets, and every one of us is trying to figure it out. You just have to become the puzzle, not the piece. Amazing. That, all of that clapping is making me blush. <laughs> and you can't tell, so that's always a good thing. <laughs> Thank you. So where did you get this love of story? Well, I, I was volunteering at the Salvos. When I, my brother and I were put into year nine, having no clue how to speak the language. We were literally, we were literally mutes in class. And by 2010, we were supp supposedly have become graduates of VCE, uh, which was, yeah, you get, you get rushed through that process. So I started, started volunteering at the Salvos, uh, and there was a lady who dropped off a bunch of books, and she had in there 101 Disney classics, um, and also Dr. S Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss. And I'm looking at these pictures and thinking, I should be able to read this. And it was a, was a moment of realization of either to, to, to to, to act like it was all right to be illiterate, but at the same time, 
do something with it. And then I found the, the audio books that come with it. And then I started lip syncing along to that. And of course, with the, with, with, with the, exp with the hip hop storytelling aspect of the musical genre. And then I guess in some way, shape or form, one of the things that mom saw happening with that was how frustrated I was f from not, not being able to go to, go to year seven, which, which, was, which was what I wanted to do. Uh, but it didn't allow me, and it just it just came from the obsession of 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 doing it over and over and over and over. And I think one of the things of living out in Lilydale uh, is how outspoken the people over there are. And at some point, you you can either contribute to that conversation or you can neglect it. On one one bright Saturday, a lady jumped off the bus and she started touching my skin, and she said she'd never seen a black person before except the movies. I'm thinking this is so good. Uh, <laughs> so good. But then I had I had to contribute to that in a sense of conversation, and it, it, it just motivated me to, uh, to as much as that, take an interest in people rather than being the one that, that stands up. Yeah. Yeah. And you try, that, that's an amazing story of, of finding it within yourself. Mm. Is that why you for, founded Creative Rebellion Youth too? I mean, just, just needed a space to identify with other, with, with other young people who, um, just, just feel oppressed. Um, and it's, it, it, it all has to do with a matter of l learning to, I think. Once more, if you don't know how to express yourself, you start to suffocate your feelings and your emotions. And I, I keep saying it all the time. Four, f three, four years ago, I couldn't read properly, and I still don't know if I do or if it's just coming from memory. Uh, but of course, it's, it's being able to, I think when I was going through it, not being able to read, illiteracy felt like, felt like a nightmare that I don't think children should ever have to go through, or in spite of your background and your experiences. So it's pretty much trying to convey that idea to other people, that if you, when you're illiterate, you really are in trouble. Because you cannot, you can't understand who you are as a person. And once you learn to read and write, you kind of become accountable for the life you want to live. And being in this country, you, uh, you if you don't find a way to contribute, then you're just being selfish. Uh, and this, this, this art form has kind of allowed me to do that. Uh, it's interesting what you say about how you, you couldn't, if you couldn't express yourself, you'd, you'd do something. That's what Antonio did in your book. He couldn't express himself. Yeah. And I think he couldn't. Um, I think the problem with him, and I guess I, I see it with other, um, with my own migrant family and, and other migrants in the community, is that it's so hard to. I, and I, just listening to a lot of your spoken word over the last few days, um, it's really hard to articulate to other people where you've come from and what that's like. And we can kind of start to piece it together. You know, when you're talking last night about seeing unlimited refills at Hungry Jacks for the first time, and you know that that. I, and the toilet um, flushing and the waste of water, um, and, and and I think that that's what it's like for um, Antonio, my main character. He doesn't really know how to, um, even after being in the country for for so many years, he still feels. Um, anxious um, about his status there um, and what people think about him there and he doesn't know how to articulate what his relationship is with the land or with the other migrants who, who came later than him. Mm. I think people forget how much um, Australians are pretty much the setting example for uh, the rest of the world in terms of the way we treat humans. But I think the recent force-fed fear of thinking refugees are coming here for, I mean, to not assimilate and things of that nature is a bit ridiculous. I mean, we, keep, we keep forgetting the, the flip side of that. Once you have someone who has never had what you've got, they kind of teach you how to appreciate what you have. Mm -hmm. I think, at, at, I mean, when, when we're talking about the, the, the flashing of the, of, of, of the water, my brother used to wash his feet on there and pee on the sink. See, <laughs> reverse. And the first time we went to Coles, we saw all the milk lined up and we thought poor cows in the back of this store just being <laughs> 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 there's all that joy that comes from being able to to, to welcome someone um, and then them marveling at what you have and it kind of reminds you of how much you need to appreciate that I think that's that's one of the things we're lacking these days I think my family came from a gen the, the way my family got accepted to come to Australia was from a generation of Australians who understood their responsibility in terms of stepping in for other people um, where now it's almost like there's a generation of Australians who's just being, being force-fed 
uh, fear by, by people who represent Australians who aren't really understanding what everyday people in Alice are like or what everyday people in, in, in the regional Australia are like. And it's like we, we, we get deprived from, from, from more stories like this or what makes us identify as, 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 as humans. And I mean, this could be one of the greatest countries in the world. That's one of my mom's arguments anyway. But I think, which brings me to this, she, she, she keeps telling me to ask this by a show of hand, who here voted for Tony Abbott? See, honest people. <laughs> we still don't know how that man slipped into office, but still. <laughs> I, well, I think Tony Abbott and, and um, everything that we see on the news is made up of these these small sound bites that feed paranoia. Mm. You know, like we will decide who comes to this country and the manner in which they come. Um, you, we will stop the boats. We will mm. turn the boats around. Um, we have all of these very small, and the, and they're not even new phrases. If you actually look into the history of Australia, like these kind of phrases were being used since early colonial Australia. Um, people, like literally politicians, were were. Um, mm running on platforms to, to um, stop boats coming. Um, they were frightened of the Chinese coming in and, and um, invading Australia. Um, it, it, those, <laughs> those small repetitive sound bites are, are the stuff of paranoia and it's the stuff that we see all the time, all the time, all the time. Well, we might open the floor to questions because I know there's going to be some questions out there. Who's going to get the ball rolling? This lady here. Oh, Robbie's coming with a microphone your way. I can just beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, um, I sometimes wonder whether or not... First of all, let's start off with your name, because this lady right here is definitely not your name. <laughs> right? What, what uh, is your name? Uh, Robin Delaney. Robin Delaney. Um, I sometimes wonder if some of the fear that we get in, in Australia, and I'm generalising about um, mm. people coming by boats, people coming in. H how much of that is because we're an island nation and we don't actually share physical borders where you can look across and see people across the river, the fence, the whatever? And I'm just wondering what you both think of that. That is first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's um, there's I, two of you, so we're going to get two perspectives. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that, that part of it is that as well. But what, what I think is very interesting is that, you know, in Europe, for example, um, they're, they're using the same phrases um, about people who cross borders, um, who cross land borders. Um, but certainly it, it is... Um, that fear of the boat is so much a part of our national psyche. Um, f again, from early colonisation to today, it is who we are. Um, the figure of the boat is really what I, I think, unfortunately, defines us as a nation. And I wonder if, if we can turn that around and be less paranoid about it, if we could be different people. Um, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> I, I, I haven't written a book. <laughs> what a good way to get out of it. That's a good one. Good one. I don't think people give um, the average Australian the benefit of the doubt in terms of if if all the people who live in this country had to have a say. I think it would be completely different. Uh, but then again, when you have a media that is so driven in terms of trying to entertain the public from from a falsified perspective and and make it and getting no other say except just this idea of the losses of jobs and things of that nature, so it comes back in full, uh, full circle, regardless, regardless of how much jobs get, get, get lost to industries. It's got to come back because people need to work, which means people need to be able to uh, buy these things that are being produced. So the fear com comes back to just this notion of uh, people who are coming to pretty much rip off this country. That's never the case. My mother hated welfare. Uh, but she, she, she sees it as a, as a stepping stone for, 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 for people who get to start off. Everybody wants to have aspiration. This country allows you to have aspiration. So the question is, are we jealous that somebody else might come in here and utilize the freedom that we have to the full extent better than we are doing it? That's got to be it. It's got to be the, the jealousy aspect of it. Of, of, because the, the, the notion of, uh, of, of refugees coming here and doing any other thing than representing this country much better than, I'm not sure if I was going to say this, much better than Australians, uh, <laughs> scary. Because, at, but we do need them in a sense that we need someone to, to remind us from 
time to time how much we're taking what we have for granted and utilize to the full extent. The definition of freedom is to do whatever you want to do within 24 hours. <laughs> that's, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much it, which means there's so much more that this country has to offer to the world. But it's just this, the people who represent the Australian public are force-feeding people fear from statistics, and you can't rely on the statistics. I wonder also if it kind of um, constrains the kind of stories that migrants can tell. Um, like, for example, um, this might seem like a bit of a leak, but I'm going to connect America and Australia. Uh, like I was watching um, recently in the news, you know, where Trump banned all of um, basically everyone from every Arab Muslim country. And I was meant to go to Boston last week uh, to fly back in, and my travel was unauthorized because I'm on the birth certificate it says being born in Sudan. There you go. And I'm like, I'm Australian. <laughs> like it was the only time I actually had a fit with the, with the United Airlines. I'm Australian. <laughs> I've never been able to say this. <laughs> I, but I, I think kind of um, almost the problem with the stories that came out of that is, you know, all over Twitter and all over the news, everyone's like, this doctor got banned from coming in, you know, mm -hmm. to America, this human rights activist, this, you know, um, amazing person who, who did these amazing things. Um, and I wonder, like, can't we just kind of say, well, they're just human beings. Like, can't migrants also just be people who, like, shit and eat and breathe, you know? Like, why, why are we um, so constrained by only telling stories about, um, about migrants that are heroes? Is, is that because we are afraid? Is that a kind of another, is that another way of us showing that we are afraid? Um, that we can't just accept stories about migrants who are like normal human beings who maybe do things wrong sometimes, you know, who, who, who fear, um, 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 yeah, part of that is where my main character comes from too, I think. Is that a pressure for you, like, though? Because, Sorry. like, well, I think that there would be extra pressure on you to, to always be, like, um, you know, an upstanding citizen. Mm. I mean, I'm certainly not an upstanding citizen all the time. I can't imagine what kind of pressure that would, that, that would be. That I'm sounds really hard to me. I'm just trying to make sure I'm on the right side of the team that's about to win the footy. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll buy a whole different set of uh, new flags. <laughs> when Geelong won, I was suddenly a Geelong supporter. <laughs> when Hawthorne won, I was like, yeah. <laughs> when Western Bulldogs won, I was like, of course, I'm from Footscray. <laughs> 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 no, but there's, there's so much joy in balancing out um, trying to be an outstanding citizen. I mean, I mean uh, it would have been nice if I was knighted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would the country have been shocked though? Like, really? Would, would the country <laughs> have been shocked? But at the same time, it's like, uh, I'm trying to weigh my... W recently, when, 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 when the prince uh, decided to retire, it was a big topic at home. I think we, we were like, what? who retires? Who, what prince do you know would retire from, <laughs> from doing this? <laughs> I'll do it for the rest of my life. <laughs> no, but I, 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 the pressure is not there. I think that's one of the reasons why... Um, because you get to, you have preferences and choices and options. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's one of the greatest things about this country. Period. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you, every single day you can, you can make, it, you can, you can decide which, which direction to take your life. That's mm -hmm. that's empowering. That's one of the things that this country allows its citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, We've mm -hmm. definitely cut you out of the conversation, didn't we? Yeah. It's just, oh. I'm so... I was going to say that's what. <laughs> yeah, we forget sometimes the the citizens here. You know, they they forget that they have those options. But we also, here's the thing though, um, as much as we speak about refugee experiences, we, we need to hear more of the privileged side of what, it's, what it means to be someone who was born in Australia, who was raised in Australia, who grew up with Australian ways. It's almost like all of those stories are being silent because the big picture now, or the big topic of conversation is this idea of struggle and how people who come from it, um, we can forget that the, we also want to be able to hear from the people who've lived in privilege and what's that like for us to be able to imitate the way the Australian public lives rather than shining the spotlights um, on, on, on everybody else that, that is supposedly had, had a rough life. It's like, cool, that's fine. But at the same time, how has your privilege benefited you? That could be, that could be a way for the, for the rest of the world to kind of copy. Um, I guess we just don't understand, really, mm. like un until we hear um, you know the stories from 
from people like you. May, I, I think it would. I think so much privilege in Australia is so unconscious. Mm. Mm. Okay, another question. That one kept us busy for a while. Anyone? Put your hand up, and Robbie will come with a mic. Look at all those hands going up. <laughs> all those hands. Oh, there's one over here. No. Oh, you'll just no. <laughs> Not questioning, waiting. That was a good one. <laughs> who, who are you having at? There's someone. Oh, there's one down here. Hi, um, thanks for the great um, discussion so far. Um, what is I, your name? My name is Sheena. Sheena, nice. And throughout this festival, there have been lots of themes, of course. Two of the big ones being two struggles, which, as we know, are reconciliation, the you know relationship between the West and Aboriginal culture, mm. and then also multiculturalism, as you're talking about now, which is the relationship between migrants and the people who are living on the land. I wonder if you could comment on um, the growing amount of literature that is perhaps not as prevalent in that third space. So as, as we all agree, these are two you know, fronts of struggle, reconciliation and migrants, uh, m migration and multiculturalism. Um, and as the arts world and your literature and your writing and our stories populate those two imaginative spaces, how do you see the third one, that is the one between migrants and Aboriginal people emerging in the arts world? You should be sitting here right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very good question. Well, you have that um, that lovely piece you do. You, uh, you did it last night. Um, mm. Mm. So you have considered this, Abe, in your in your creative work. Indeed, I, I only thought about it because because my mum just checks me all the time. Um, she she checks all of us really. I think one of the things she identifies with from from she, she's from a from a particular tribe in Sudan where. Everything is poetical. If you want to, um, <clears throat> if you want to get married, you have to write a poetical piece to 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 the woman. And, and if she likes it, cool. If she doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and she, she's recognized that in the indigenous tradition. And I think she's she's become a lot fascinated by it, but the lack of its representation. And I think one one of our favorite channels recently is, is the in, NITV channel. And so she's almost um, at a point where she's taken to the mind about how rich that culture is and how much she identifies with it. I think in response to your question, it really boils down to us taking the time and taking an interest. And as well as that, as much as literature is becoming uh, audio books, the gifts of audio books, I think the more audio books we have in, in different indigenous languages, I think the, m the less excuses we'll have in terms of uh, adapting to it and at the same time being able to uh, utilize as best as, as best as we can these platforms um, for 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 story storytelling and at the same time being able to identify with a lot of the things that the, the indigenous people would would want to share with us rather than us trying to interpret what they are going through because really the only thing I'm, the only thing I know did you do uh, in the recent Chanel backlash for the, what was it? Boomerang. Boomerang. I mean, how ridiculous can you get as, as a billion dollar, one of the, billion, one of the most prestigious um, industries in fashion to kind of not even have some form of connectivity to, to what that symbolizes? I think it boils down to, to people really de not demanding it, but asking for ways in how we can participate as, as listeners and at the same time as people who want to understand the indigenous culture and how we can best represent it as Australians because we're in this together now. There, there is some great work, like I just at the library in town here, they were showing me these books they they they'd done and using iPhones you can, you know, hear it in language. Um, so there's iPhones have their, their um, uses in this, in this field, especially as much as we get annoyed by them. Mm. So there is some great work being done in that field, basically. Um, I, Western Sydney is often known for its migrant population, but it actually also has the highest number of Indigenous people um, in any urban area um, in Australia. 
Um, and that means just naturally there is always an incredible dialogue going on between um, the, the migrant and the indigenous community um, who have always had very um, close ties. Um, and as you know, a writer in that community, I've seen a lot of that kind of third space being explored in the writing community because there are actually lots of writing groups um, around Western Sydney where there are both Indigenous and migrant writers. Um, and actually there was a really interesting project where some migrant writers from Western Sydney came up to Tennant Creek a couple of years ago um, and produced an anthology um, of the work that they did together. And the way that they kind of did that is the um, the migrant Western city kids kind of spoke about their stories of their place um, and the indigenous communities in Tennant Creek talked about their stories of their place and they both um, taught each other what they knew about writing so they had like an indigenous leader teaching the migrant kids about writing and they had a migrant writer from Western Sydney teaching the indigenous kids about writing um, and then they 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 published um, the migrant work and the indigenous work together in, in this anthology on either side and you kind of um, flip it around um, to read each voice. So um, I, I do, I, and that was published by um, uh, an organisation called um, Bank Sound Youth Development Services. Um, you can find that online actually. Um, you can find um, e e the, that in electronic form online. Um, so yeah, I think Western Sydney is a really exciting space where, where maybe that, that third space can, can happen and where we can think about that and how we're going to use it. And Western S Sydney is also known for its spoken word as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can't do it, so it kind of makes me a bit oh, unwest. You're on a book. Who's doing the audio book for your book? Who does the audio book? Who's going to do it? I, I've never had an audio book. I wish someone would. Do, do you want to do the You're audio book? You're going to have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's part and parcel of spoken word. I'll do it. Yeah, you should do it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Done. Uh, we'll We've got time for one paper. last question. Whoa. Who's going to take this one? Uh, a oh, brave man there. No, he's just waving. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> G'day, I'm Paul. Hey guys. My name's Dave. Um, Hi Dave. <laughs> I, so I work with some younger people at a school and I'm, I'm sort of wondering, you know, a lot of people have this idea of I'm not creative, I'm not a good writer, I'm not good at, you know, putting things into words. Just wondering, what are some ideas on how do you light that fire under people to kind of shift that idea from I can't do to, huh, maybe I can actually do this? I want to hear this from you. I really want to know your answer. Cool, cool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. You had to use that last question to put pressure on me, huh? <laughs> no, uh, f first of all, uh, both my parents were illiterate, um, and yet they envisioned this for, 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 for the eight kids, well, the nine kids that they've had. And um, I think you have to realize, that regardless of your circumstances, uh, imagination is for everyone, which means creativity is something that we can tap in at any time. It's just a matter of whether we want to or we don't. Uh, I think every one of us can become curious about something and then pursuing it. But at the same time, the thing about illiteracy is it, it, it pretty much handicaps you. You can't, you can't utilize your mind. And, uh, but here's the thing though, time, t time, time is power. You just, gotta, you just gotta utilize that in whatever way, shape or form to allow you to propel to become whatever it is you want to become. And really, th there was a story about a man who fell off, fell off a building and people on the fifth floor heard him scream so far, so good. And he, <laughs> he, he just wanted to see if he could fly. Uh, that, that is creativity. That is someone who applied themselves. <laughs> uh, so really, there's, there's no excuse. There is no excuse. You, imagination is for everyone. Cre creativity is just the fancy term that we use um, for people that we put on a, on a pedestal. Everybody's got it. You can access it. Yeah. I think what's always been really um, important for me in my workshops that are run in community um, um, is to read them like stories of ordinary spaces and to get them to write stories of their own places. So I think, and I understand this as a writer, you know, everyone wants to be like the next JK Rowling and everyone wants to write Twilight. Like you go into every school, they're all writing like Twilight ripoffs, yeah. right? 
And and so like one of the first things that I try to say is that you know um, everybody's writing Twilight. Um, there's there's nobody that's writing about. Um, you know the the east of Al eastern suburbs of Alice Springs. I never heard a story like that before. Um, I'd love to hear a story like that. I, I wrote a story of a community that like I couldn't imagine anyone would ever want to read about Parramatta, um, but most of it's set in like Parramatta Westfield and Parramatta McDonald's car park, um, and you know um, those are the spaces where lives happen, but it's also the spaces where stories are um, and. I think that getting kids to write is often about getting them to value their own spaces as something that can be the stuff of stories. I, mm. I mean, to add to that, um, negative, negativity kind of allows you to become your own obstacle. But if, if, if you think positively, positively and just become driven with that energy, I think your creativity can excel easily. You just got to learn to believe in what you uh, what you're doing, why you're doing it, which is the three questions. What do I want? Why do I want it? Um, and who will benefit from it? And one of the reasons why I still do spoken word is because I get to tell other people, uh, I'm hoping that it, it encourages other people to kind of understand what it means to pretty much foot, put to full use this notion of freedom of speech. But these days we don't have any speech that is worth hearing. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, you think about it though. Uh, Good for you. Pauline, <laughs> yeah. Pauline Hanson is kind of exercising her voice, which means the average citizen needs to do the same in, in, resp in res not responding to that, but just being able to say that, that that person does not represent me. This is the power of spoken word, but at the same time, the power of creativity is being able to exercise your freedom to its full extent. Um, and these students need to realize that. Well, we've run out of time on that note, so. Everybody, I want you to say thank you to Felicity Castagna and Abe Nook. Can we, can we? <laughs> Other way around. And um, up next in the gallery is the Gulf Country Songbook, which I know everybody's dying to go to. And if you missed tickets to the Dark Emu dinner, which is sold out, there are tickets still to the reading rooms at the residency tonight, which is. <laughs> no, okay. But uh, we, we want to thank you guys as well. So give us. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> it can't be that book. Okay, I'm kidding. Okay. Thank you all. Thank for you.